Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's digital editor. My role today is simply to shepherd you through some excellent content from our partners, Waters. I'll introduce our speakers and then hand over to them to answer all of your questions. Speaking of questions, that's the real advantage of a webinar format. It's not just an online video that you watch. You really get to interact with experts in their field. And you can ask questions at any point throughout this presentation. There is a questions box, most likely at the bottom of your go-to webinar panel, which by default is probably down one side of your screen. It'll be somewhere else if you're using a phone. Get your questions in at any time. It doesn't matter what they are, anything that's inspired by the presentation that you're going to watch and we will do our best to put as many of them as possible to our guest speakers uh, as we come to the end of the presentation. Now, a couple of questions that are commonly asked about webinars and similar presentations. Firstly, will you get a copy of the presentation? We choose not to share slides because we think that what is important is the context of the slides along with what's being said by our speakers. So rather than just sharing the slides, what we will do is send you a copy or a link to the recorded version of this webinar where you get all the, the slide content. But you also get that important context of what's being said and you get the Q&A and a the aspects of it as well. So uh, do keep an eye out on your email. You will see a link to that recording in a day or so's time. And in the same email, for those of you who have attended live, you'll get a link to a certificate, which is just our way of saying thank you for uh, attending, for turning up for the real live event itself, and for making sure that you make the most of the webinar itself. Now, today's webinar is on lithium-ion battery electrolyte degradation characterization by mass spectrometry. Now, most of you are probably watching this webinar on a device that is powered by a lithium-ion battery, and if you're not, then I would put money on there being one within arm's reach, somewhere near you, a phone, a Kindle, a laptop, all of those sorts of things, or maybe you've got an electric or a hybrid electric car out on your drive. They are powered by lithium-ion batteries, which are now so ubiquitous that we don't really think about them all that much. But actually, the first commercial lithium-ion battery was only released about 30 years ago. And we've been able to make them smaller, safer, increase their charge density, make them more powerful, make them last longer. And the tools that we've used are the sorts of things that we're looking at today. So we're going to look at how you can use analytical characterization to study certain aspects of the battery, understand what happens during the charge discharge cycle, how those batteries age, and really help to make better batteries, which will allow us to go further in our electric cars, reduce our reliance on the existing infrastructure and electric grid, and hopefully drive us towards a more sustainable future just by breaking some of those uh, current barriers that we already have. In particular today, as the title suggests, we're looking at the electrolyte within the battery, and we'll also be asking you a couple of questions as we go through, little poll questions to find out where your research sits uh, amongst all of this, and try and understand who you are as an audience, as well as our speakers. Now, we have uh, one recorded presentation for you today, and that is by uh, Brian Katzenmeyer, who is a Senior Manager for Material Science at Waters Corporation. 15 years experience with a speciality in mass spec and separation techniques for the characterization of materials, polymers, monomers, and small molecules. Now, he has prepared this in advance for us to make sure that we can fit as much into the time as possible. But he's also going to be here for the Q&A at the end of the presentation, and he'll be joined then by two of his colleagues from Waters, Chris Stumpf, who is also Senior Manager with this for Strategic Program Development in Materials Science, and Sarah Dowd, who is a Senior MS Application Specialist, again, from Waters. They know exactly what they're talking about, and they're exactly the right people to answer all of your questions. We're very lucky to have them with us. Thank you to Waters for partnering up with us for this webinar and many other events to make sure that we get the true value of their expertise. So do keep your questions coming in. I can see we've already had one or two. Uh, including the obvious questions of can I get a link to the recorded version. As already said, keep an eye out on your inbox. That will be with you shortly. So I'm going to hand over to the first part of the recording now, after which we'll go into our first poll. Then there's a bit more recording, and then we will come to Q&A a little bit later on. If you do experience any technical problems, fire us a message. My colleagues from Chemistry World hopefully will be able to help you through that. If you do find that the video stalls or anything like that happens, just exit the webinar, come back, and you should be able to pick up where you left off. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to Waters and for our team, our panel today, Brian, Chris and Sarah. Let's hit the first part of the video and I'll see you shortly.
Thank you, Ben, for the welcome and introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Katzenmeyer. And in this presentation, we will showcase a methodology for characterizing lithium ion battery electrolyte and additive degradation by high resolution mass spectrometry, or HRMS. Before we begin today, I want to let you know that I will be joined by my colleagues, Chris Stump and Sarah Dowd, after the conclusion of the presentation. Together, we will address any questions you may have in the Q&A. This presentation is broken into three parts. First, I will give you some context on why lithium ion batteries are important for a sustainable society. Second, I will highlight the six main challenges that exist in lithium ion battery research and development. And lastly, I will illustrate an analytical methodology that can help address some of the lithium ion battery R&D challenges by characterizing electrolyte degradation by using high resolution mass spectrometry. So why are lithium ion batteries important? They're important because they're useful in two primary areas. They serve as energy storage devices in consumer electronics and electric or hybrid electric vehicles. The reason lithium ion batteries have been so successful is that they have technical advantages such as excellent cycling performance, no memory, little self discharge, wide temperature range of operation, and high specific capacity and voltage. With all the technical advantages of lithium ion batteries, there are a couple of barriers that exist to wider adoption. First, the energy intensive applications such as electric vehicles, lithium ion batteries are reaching their energy storage capacity. And second, We'll probably have all heard in the news of consumer electronic devices catching on fire, so there's a concern about safety. There are some significant economic consequences of poor safety, as you can imagine. First, there's the potential for product recalls after a fire or accident. Second, there's the potential for litigation resulting from personal or property harm. And third, there's the potential for reputational harm if lithium ion battery technology and the products that are used experience catastrophic failures. The previous slide presented the advantages and some of the downsides of lithium ion battery technology. There's probably no better advantage of lithium ion battery technology than its potential to bring about a sustainable society. Lithium ion battery technology can help bring about a carbon neutral future. Of course, electrified vehicles will require generated electricity, but it's hoped that electrification will reduce CO2 emissions and perhaps even become carbon neutral. In other words, the CO2 emissions that we produce no longer increase from year to year. If we're able to halt the increase in carbon emissions, then we may be able to stabilize climate change. We've also seen a number of pledges made by companies and governments across the globe. The first is from the largest automobile manufacturer in the US stating that General Motors plans to sell a largely electrified fleet by the year 2035. The next pledge is from the European Union, which pledges to be carbon neutral by 2050. And the third is China's pledge to be carbon neutral by 2060. Another concept I need to highlight is the concept of sustainability. Carbon neutrality falls under the umbrella of sustainability. But what is sustainability? It may seem like a simple question, but in reality, sustainability has different meaning depending on who you ask. If you ask the United Nations, they might point to the Brundtland Commission report that says sustainability development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In other words, we should use natural resources in such a way that something still exists for our grandchildren. So there's a recycling aspect. The UN might also point to 17 sustainable development goals that they formulated in order to promote civil harmony. If you ask a business person, he or she may talk about the triple bottom line. First and foremost will be the economic incentive to make money. But businesses today are also concerned about the environmental and social costs of business operations. Worrying about the social and economic impacts can be largely about minimizing costs, for example, the cost of litigation, the cost of cleaning up environmental contamination, or the cost of increasing commodity prices. To the environmental advocate, they may look to a business person's triple bottom line as simple greenwashing, or in other words, talking about things that are good for society but in reality, only worried about reducing the cost of cleaning up environmental contamination or the costs of litigation. I don't think I can leave you with the resolved concept of sustainability, but I do want to leave you with the idea that sustainability means something different depending on who you talk to, and there's a certain level of contradiction embedded in the concept. 
These three gentlemen are the inventors of the lithium ion battery technology. If you haven't seen their Nobel Prize acceptance speeches, I provided the URL in the slide here. I encourage you to take a look at them if you're curious. In their presentations, they said many interesting things about the development of the first lithium ion battery technology, but there are two things I want to highlight with you that resonated with me. First, they said that, that they may have won the Nobel Prize for developing lithium ion battery technology, but the work isn't done yet. There's still a lot of research yet to be done and that is primarily centered on six areas, reducing the cost of the lithium ion battery, increasing the energy storage capacity, increasing the power output, improving the cycle life or longevity of lithium ion batteries, increasing battery safety, and developing batteries that are more benign to the environment. Current lithium ion batteries have a lot of chemical components that have questionable environmental properties. The second major takeaway I had from their presentations is actually Yoshio San's presentation where he said that he believes that lithium ion batteries will have bring about a sustainable society. That's where my previous two slides were talking about and hopefully I give you the insight that some of the ways that lithium ion battery technology might reduce carbon emissions. Okay, so that was the general context of why lithium ion batteries technology is important. Now I want to shift gears and talk about the battery itself. To understand some of the R&D challenges within lithium ion batteries, you really only need to know about the four main parts of the lithium ion battery. As you can imagine with any battery technology, there's the anode and the cathode. As a user of batteries, these are the terminals that you hook up to your devices. As a researcher, there's all kinds of work still being done on improving the materials that go into the cathode and the anode. The research can focus on improving energy storage or look for anode materials that are less likely to catch on fire. Another important part of the lithium ion battery is the separator. This is usually a porous polyolefin polymer that acts as a membrane to allow lithium ion to swim back and forth between the anode and cathode. The separator's chief function is as a safety device because it prevents the anode and cathode from short circuiting with each other. And lastly, there's the electrolyte solution. This is a water-free solvent that the lithium ion swims in as it moves back and forth like a rocking chair between an anode and cathode. The electrolyte solution is the focus of this presentation. The previous slide illustrated the four main parts of the lithium ion battery but that was a largely theoretical description. This slide illustrates the commercial forms that lithium ion batteries take. First, there is the cylindrical battery, and this is the common type of battery used in electric vehicles. In fact, there are, will be thousands of these cells in a typical electric car battery pack. Second, there is the coin cell. It's small and very similar to a watch battery. It is largely used for R&D purposes. Third is the prismatic cell. It is shaped like a candy bar and is often used in mobile phones. And fourth is the pouch cell. It has the advantage of high energy capacity, but it will tend to swell if something goes wrong with the battery. Before we get into an electrolyte degradation study, I need to describe to you a little bit about the operation of a battery. As I mentioned previously, lithium ions swims back and forth between the anode and cathode like a rocking chair. The lithium ion can swim directly through the polymer separator. When the lithium ions leave the anode, it gives up an electron to feed your electronic device. When the battery is charged, the lithium ion leaves the cathode and re-intercalates with the graphite structure and regains the electron that it gave up during discharge. One interesting thing that a lithium ion battery does during its first one or two charges is build up what's called a solid electrolyte interface on the anode. This SEI is comprised of lithium, solvent, and additives. Very likely, it's also comprised of chemical combinations of lithium hexafluoride, solvents, and additives. This may sound like a bad thing, but the SEI is actually a good thing because it provides some structural integrity to the graphite structure in the anode. So in one way, you can think of it as a safety device. And a similar formation forms on the cathode, and this is called the cathode electrolyte interface. All of this is still normal operation. Now, what happens if things go wrong? Say the battery heats up too much. 
then you get a breakdown in the SEI and potential oxygen release. You may also get chemical side reactions. Some of these side reactions are called parasitic reactions because they rob the battery of its normal electrochemical reactions that help fuel power production and storage. If the temperature increase gets out of control, then the side reactions, parasitic reactions, and the SEI decomposition can accelerate. All of these reactions can lead to the production of unwanted liquid and gaseous chemical components. Ultimately, if there's too much gas produced, the battery can expand and rupture. Some of this hot gas can be flammable, so it can catch on fire. There are a number of ways of managing battery operation that goes outside the normal range. For example, passive temperature management to active liquid cooled temperature management. Another method is to add additives that suppress side reactions, flammability, and so on. As I previously mentioned, this study will take a closer look at the electrolytes and the additives using mass spectrometry paired with GC and LC to follow the volatile and non-volatile chemical components. This illustrates graphically what I just described to you on the previous slide. When a battery starts to go outside of its normal operation temperatures, it can lead to side reactions that produce volatile and non-volatile chemical components. So this presentation is going to focus on the electrolyte chemistry and illustrate a mass spectrometry-based methodology that can give battery researchers insight into battery cycle life and safety. Recall that the cycle life and safety are two of the six R&D areas mentioned in the Nobel Prize presentations. As I mentioned previously, to ensure lithium ion batteries continue to operate within their normal operating parameters, additives are added to the electrolyte solution. There are six primary categories of lithium ion battery additives and they can interact in complex ways. Their purpose is to promote battery safety, battery performance, and battery lifetime. This graphic is arranged in interacting cycles because electrolyte additives interact with each other in complex ways, and these interactions are still a topic of active research. Getting the additive package right is quite like the additive packages in your motor oil of your car. If the additives do their job well, then you will have a really great experience with your car. But if not, the experience can lead to bad and potentially lead to costly repairs. With lithium ion batteries, if the battery doesn't last, it may mean the consumers will throw away a perfectly good device only because the device can't keep a charge and as a result becomes unusable. The net result is that due to the critical importance of lithium ion battery to functioning of the battery itself, we really need to understand the electrolyte chemistry. Here are a few examples of how we can characterize a lithium ion battery using analytical techniques. There are several ways to think about analytical characterization of lithium ion batteries. For example, analyzing the whole battery or analyzing inside the battery. To analyze the whole battery, you can use a technique such as calorimetry. Calorimetry allows you to understand how an additive package is working by measuring the heat changes of the whole battery. One promising area of focus on battery calorimetry is the focus on parasitic reactions that occur within the electrolyte solution. Once we have an idea of how the entire battery is performing, you can drill down into some of the chemistry by looking at the chemical components themselves with GCMS and LCMS. Another area inside the battery that you can look at is the battery polymeric casing and the porous polymeric separator that is situated between the anode and cathode. By using thermal analysis techniques such as DSC and TGA, you can gain an understanding on how a battery's polymeric materials withstand changes in temperatures or even at elevated temperatures. You can also study lithium ion batteries with NMR, FTIR, scanning electron microscopy, and ICPMS. I'll bring specific answers to the study of the battery, but for this presentation, I'm going to focus on looking at what's going on with the electrolyte solution with mass spectrometry. Well, thank you to Brian for the first part of today's presentation. There is still more to come, but we just wanted to pause for a minute, give you an opportunity 
to collect your thoughts, maybe type in a couple of the questions that have already occurred to you. I can see we've had a few already. Do keep them coming in. And while we're doing this, let's find out a little bit more about you before we go next to do the next part of the video. So uh, let's launch this poll. We just want to find out how much of an emphasis is electrolyte uh, chemistry in your own research. So hopefully there should be a poll on your screen now and you should have the opportunity to vote and I can see the voting has already kicked off. So let us know how much of it is really featured in your work. I would hope uh, if you've been interested by a theme like this that it certainly plays at least some role. Uh, so let's find out what sort of proportion of our audience are deeply engaged with this and who are purely interested uh, from a, uh, an academic perspective, shall we say. Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah, a reminder, please keep your questions coming in. They're really useful for us. Uh, it helps us not only to uh, make sure that we get you the answers that you need and, and shed any additional light on anything that you've seen in the presentation, but it also uh, allows us to know useful things to put into future presentations and future webinars. Now, Waters and Chemistry World have done a series of webinars before, are likely to do more in the future. Uh, they're, they're very popular partner with us and so this will really help us to shape the sorts of things that you want to know a bit more about so keep those questions coming in uh, I can see almost enough of you have now voted in the poll so I'm going to uh, close that in about five seconds this is your last chance to get your votes in I can see a few people have rushed to the button to make sure that they can get their votes in and that is enough and it's actually a surprisingly even spread i'll very quickly share this so you can see where you sit in and amongst the audience but as you can see uh, there's quite a lot of you who uh, don't actually actively research uh, the electrolytes at the moment but then there's a reasonable spread and there's a hardcore nine percent of our current audience who spend almost all of their time researching electrolytes uh, so hopefully you'll get a great deal from this and those of you who are just interested maybe this will be a future research decision for you to make so thank you for completing the poll more polls coming up uh, as we go through the rest of the presentation but for now we will hand back to brian for the second part of today's presentation we'll be back with some more polls and a few questions later on to keep them coming in All right, now to the application example. But before I do, I should say that I'm a mass spectrometrist and not a battery engineer. So I'm gonna focus on the methodology using GC and LC coupled to mass spectrometry to study lithium ion battery electrolytes and additives. I won't be giving you any comprehensive insights into battery engineering, but I will illustrate an analytical methodology that will give you some insight into chemical aspects of the electrolyte and additive solutions. The setup of the application is shown here. The battery will go through various stages of charge and discharge, and we will take a look at the electrolyte solution at the various cycles in order to see what, the impur what impurities are being formed. After the battery goes through its charge-discharge cycles, some of the electrolyte solution will be sampled for analysis. One of the primary comparisons that we will make is between the, an unused battery and a battery that has gone through charge discharge cycles. The next several slides will illustrate the analytical characterization workflow, the samples, and give you insight into some of the electrolyte analytes. Lastly, I listed some of the solvents and additives that we should expect to see. Here's an example of the sample configuration for this study. We have five samples. The sample on the right, labeled YY, is a sample that has not undergone any charge or discharge cycles. The rest of the batteries have undergone 1, 40, 180, or 200 charge discharge cycles. All of these samples will be compared in order to identify their differences. Here we illustrate some of the chemical components that we expect to see in a electrolyte solution. There are three primary categories of analytes. There are the carbonate solvents, solutes, and the various additives. This is not an exhaustive listing of electrolyte components, but more of an example to illustrate the types of organic molecules likely to be present. We expect a couple of things that will happen in the electrolyte solution. First, we expect the electrolyte will degrade as it goes through its charge and discharge cycles. Some of these degradants will be volatile and some will be non-volatile. In order to investigate the volatile and non-volatile chemical components, we will need to deploy 
LC and GC. LC for the non-volatiles and GC for the volatiles. Many of the studies that you will see in the peer review literature use a separate GCMS and LCMS system. But here we are going to use the same HRMS mass spectrometer. The advantages of using the same HRMS system is simplicity and consistency in reading and interpreting the data. Further, since we're going to use an HRMS system, we will have greater confidence in our identification because we will have an accurate mass peak assignments for both the GC and LC separations. Moreover, we can use the sample comparison techniques such as multivariate analysis for both the GC and LC data. Next, I'm going to break down some advantages a, a bit further. As I mentioned, we will use GC for the volatile components, but because we are coupling the GC to an HRMS system instead of a single quadrupole mass spectrometer, we will use a technique called APGC, or Atmospheric Pressure Gas Chromatography. The advantage of APGC over traditional GCMS that uses electron ionization at 70 electron volts is that the APGC ionization technique is softer, so you will see more of the intact molecular ion. So there's a possibility of getting some quantitative information since you will have the intact molecular ion present. You can still fragment this molecular ion via MSMS by colliding this ion with an inert gas such as argon. By combining both GC and LC, you'll be able to get a better molecular coverage because you'll be able to see both the volatile and non-volatile components. Plus, you'll be able to perform multivariate statistical techniques such as principal component analysis on both types of data. Finally, this methodology will use Unify software to control the instrument, process the data, and generate reports. Unify has built-in statistical tools and structural elucidation workflows comprised of custom and predefined li chemical libraries that will be important for this example. There are two primary aspects of the analytical workflow and methodology. First, on the analytical instrument side, we're going to take a look at both the volatile and non-volatile components of the electrolyte solution. We are going to do this by hyphenating a liquid chromatographic system with then a gas chromatographic system to the same high resolution mass spectrometer. The primary advantage of this approach is so that we don't miss any of the analytes that could be either be volatile or less volatile. Also, by using the same HRMS system, the data will be consistent. I should also stress that here you would be, if you're familiar with GCMS, the approach we're going to use is slightly different than traditional GCMS, and I'll explain the difference in more detail in the subsequent slides. The second aspect of this approach is that we're going to use software to walk us through the structural elucidation steps. Two key aspects of the software workflow is the use of multivariate analysis or statistics to help us with more easily identify sample differentiations and library identification workflows using structural elucidation. Shown here is how two chromatographic systems are physically situated in relation to the HRMS. The LC is, is up to the left of the Zevo G2XS QTOF, and the GC is located to the right. All waters mass spectrometers use a universal source architecture that allows a simple swap between ionization sources for LC or GC analysis. The swap takes about 10 minutes to perform. One key aspect of the GC that we should note now is the ionization technique for the GC is APGC. As I mentioned, APGC is a softer tech ionization technique, and I will show you how it works on the next couple of slides. There are key differentiators and benefits that use it with APGC. These are ionization mode, selection between charge and proton transfer, also be able to provide less fragmentation or softer ionization, therefore giving us more specific spectra than the typically associated with traditional EI, and increased gas flow capabilities with the operation at atmospheric pressure. Here's a closer look of the APGC source interface. From the right-hand side, we have a transfer line connecting the GC oven to the source. A makeup gas of nitrogen helps deliver the analytes from the transfer line between the GC and the source of the mass spectrometer. At the tip of the transfer line, both the nitrogen makeup gas and the GC element meet prior to the APGC ion chamber. Inside the APGC source is a corona pin, 
and this creates a plasma discharge to ionize the incoming compounds. Then ultimately, the GC-separated analytes that are ionized are then directed into the mass spectrometer to the left. Depicted here are the two ionization mechanisms for APGC. The charge transfer mechanism requires a dry source condition. Often, this is favored by relatively nonpolar compounds, and this ionization mechanism results in the M plus ion. The protonization version requires a modified source, typically by placing a vial of water or methanol inside the ionization chamber. Polar compounds typically ionize this mechanism by creating the M plus H at both mechanisms are by APCI, or atmospheric pressure chemical ionization, where a chronic discharge needle is operated at atmospheric pressure. The benefits of APGC are highlighted here. Primarily, APGC generates spectra that have less fragmentation than traditional EI, and this can result into improved specificity, and we have more control over the MSMS -MS conditions because it's a softer technique. One question you might be asking is why use accurate mass screening with high resolution mass spectrometers instead of simple single quadrupoles, which is typically done with traditional GCMS. There are several reasons. First, the talk based mass spectrometer has a higher mass range. Second, a QTOF MS system provides greater control over fragmentation, so there's the possibility of getting both quantitative information in addition to qualitative mass assignments. Moreover, methods are also easy to set up and are generic. And lastly, a HRMS system allows a scientist to perform retrospective analyses by having access to all the data from past samples. And thanks again to Brian for the second part of today's presentation. Let's go for our second poll to find out a little bit more about you. So this time, are you studying electrolyte degradation with mass spectrometry? So those 9% from the first question, this is really about the specific techniques you use. And for the rest of you, uh, this is about techniques that you may use on occasion when you are doing this sort of work. So we're gonna see, uh, give you once again a, a minute or so to let as many people vote as possible. Do keep your questions coming in. Lots of really good questions coming through. Uh, I'm gonna share a link at the end of today's web Webinar for the Chemistry World Sustainability Collection. Uh, for those of you who don't specifically work on electrolytes and electrolyte degradation, if you're interested more generally in how we can make better batteries and the sorts of analytical techniques that we need to use in order to ask those questions, then there are some fantastic resources from Waters as part of that collection. So we'll share a link later on. But uh, it really gives you a, a more well-rounded picture of all the different aspects of batteries, not only how they contribute to a more sustainable future, but also how we can use these sorts of techniques to really make the most of them. So I'll share a link to that shortly, but hopefully for those of you who are more interested in batteries broadly than uh, the electrolytes, then that'll be some good resources in there for you. There's some free downloads, there's articles, there's a podcast, a video, all sorts of stuff in there in the Chemistry World Sustainability Collection. Once again, we've worked with Waters to make sure we get you the content that we need for that. We uh, are approaching, what have we got, 59% of you have voted so last few seconds for a few more people to uh, hit those vote buttons and let's see what sorts of techniques we use i can already see that some are considerably more popular than others uh, right let's close that and once again I, I may as well share it just so you can see how you uh, stand up against the, the rest of the audience 16 uh, percent are on lcms 27 percent that's the most popular individual technique in in there uh, are on gcms using that for their electrolyte work uh, but quite a lot of you not currently using mass spectrometry well i've no doubt that by the end of today's presentation you'll go away understanding how and why it's the right sort of approach to ask these kinds of questions so thank you for completing the poll we're now going to go to the final part of today's presentation so you still have a chance to get those questions in uh, for Brian, Chris and Sarah and then uh, we will ask your questions as we get to it. So final part of the video, sit back and enjoy. We'll be back with you in about 15 minutes-ish for your questions.
Historically, the challenge with using LC HRMS for screening is the data analysis workflow. In the past, the, a majority of workflows are quite manual and usually follow this routine. We manually select the peaks of interest for identification. Then we obtain a, an elemental composition from the exact mass. From there, we obtain possible structures from various online databases. After we check the literature to confirm the fragment ions that we've already seen, we can then take all this information and confirm the identified compound, which is often the most difficult part. Fast forward to today, thanks to the advancements in software, the basic workflow is now changed. We can begin by importing known information from the library and the analysis. We can also import information from existing publications, methods, or even prepare a list of potential or hypothetical impurities to screen for. We run the data using MS to the E, which is an MS met acquisition method which captures all precursor and fragment ion information in a single injection. Unify then processes the data and makes a list of every peak in the sample. The list is screened against the targeted list we created from the library or imported information. All of these targets are spectrally and structurally assigned where possible and trend plots are created. The major peaks remaining on the list have to be interrogated. We either compare them to related peaks in the sample or use manual elucidation tools in Unify, or we can search online resources such as ChemSpider to see if these unknowns have been reported previously. This slide illustrates some of the libraries available for accurate mass assignments in Unify that are available to use when screening for both targeted and untargeted compounds. We offer a number of libraries focusing on things like ENL, pesticides, drugs, traditional Chinese medicines, and synthetic adulterants. Lastly, access to ChemSpider is built into Unify for streamlined database searching. But you may be asking, what happens if there isn't a pre-existing library for my compounds? Well, it is also possible to build your own. Here we illustrate how you would build a library of lithium ion battery electrolyte components. Basically, you simply fill out a spreadsheet with the information highlighted here, and you also include a mole structure file. Then this information is imported into Unify, and the library will build itself. Here we illustrate what a chemical component looks like once when it's loaded into the Unify library. Here's an example of triethylphosphate or TEP. You can see here the structure of the compound as well as the precursor and expected fragment ions we expect to see. Using chemical components in a library is a straightforward process. Basically, you highlight your mass spectrum of interest and ask Unify to elucidate the unknown. If there's a record in your library that matches, Unify will provide an assignment. But what happens if the Unify built-in library or your custom library doesn't have an entry? Then you'll have to, the option to go to an external database. Unify has this direct link to ChemSpider, a chemical database that is curated by the Royal Society of Chemistry located in the UK. At last count, the library has over 100 million compounds. Subsequently, Unify has tools available which allows the analyst to investigate the masses of interest by using all the information provided in the raw data from accurate mass to fragment information. It allows also automated database searching by either by the user library or an online database like ChemSpider. On the Discovery tab, the user can specify IFIT level. What, so what does this mean? The software uses not only accurate mass information to propose the likely elemental compositions, but also isotope pattern to match the most likely molecular formula based on the pieces of information. The higher the I fit, the more likely proposed elemental composition matches the observed isotope pattern. You can select to use your own library or ChemSpider structural database to search for possible structures based on the molecular formula. You can also specify the minimum number of citations to narrow down the list of return structures. On the elemental composition tab, 
the user can specify elements to be used in the calculations, mass tolerances, amount of double bond equivalences, and also specify the addict. On the ChemSpider tab, the user can specify all the libraries contained in ChemSpider database needed to, to be searched or only specific libraries which contain the chemicals of interest, for example, like pesticides or pharmaceutical ingredients. And on the final tab, the parameters for the fragment match are specified. Fragment match algorithms systematically disconnects the bonds for a proposed structure and checks against high collision energy data channels to see if the matches are observed in the spectrum. The acceptable parameters for mass accuracy for fragments and how many bonds can be break can be specified in this tab. Here, the next couple slides will illustrate the parameters used in the application example. I won't dwell on these slides too much, but I want to show these parameters in case you are looking for starting points in your own methods. This specific slide shows the instrumental parameters for the GC oven and the MS parameters when using the Zevo G2XS QTOF coupled to the GC. Here are the LC and MS parameters. You will see the conditions used for this analysis, including the column. If you're interested in any of these parameters, they are available in an application note that we can send over to you. Over the next few slides, I'd like to talk about some of the potential side reactions that can occur inside the lithium-ion battery. I referenced two papers that describe these reactions. On the left-hand side is the lithium hexafluoride reaction that happens when the lithium ion swims back and forth between the anode and cathode. However, if there is a little water present, and perhaps a little heat, there can be side reactions. Ultimately, the side reaction can lead to organic phosphates. One thing that Kraft and Henschel mention in their respective papers is that these molecules are known to be nerve agents. So this potentially is harmful to people if this reaction occurs and if people are exposed to these chemical components. This has implications for battery recycling, as you can imagine. Shown here are the GC and LC chromatograms that we observe after one and 200 charge-discharge cycles. I don't know about you, but I think I can see some qualitative differences, but for the most part, they are difficult to qualify by visual inspection. A visual inspection of the GC and LC chromatograms illustrate many qualitative differences between LC to LC, GC to GC, and LC to GC but we need a more systematic approach to pull out these differences. To do that, we're going to use multivariant analysis, a statistical technique. Before jumping into the multivariant analysis, if we just perform a library match against the baseline sample, that is no charge discharge cycles, we can see many of the electrolyte solutions that we expected to see. This baseline will help will be helpful once we conduct multivariant analysis because it will allow us to see how much some of these expected analytes have changed. Also, as I showed you in a previous slide that contained the chemical reaction, we are seeing a few organophosphate molecules. So the side reactions happening inside this battery have potential safety concerns and the battery recycling scenario. Note that the chemical component that we will select to showcase the workflow will be relatively superficial in order to highlight the approach. You can easily see from the baseline spectrum that a number of chemical components is relatively large and the number of degradation products can easily multiply. Hence, we do not really have the time to dwell into the po every possible facet. So as I mentioned, by visual inspection is rather difficult to qualify qualitative differences between the samples. So we have to use a statistical technique that employs multivariant analysis to help us identify the markers that can cause one sample to be different from another. Here's the multivariant analysis investigation of the various charge discharge cycles. Here we use principal component analysis or PCA. This technique is, allows us to be, see the global perspective and just how different each charge discharge cycle is from the other groupings. Note that the grouping of the electrolytes that have undergone no charge discharge cycles is much different 
than the samples that have undergone some form of charge-discharge cycle. The basis of the groupings come from the compression of the retention time, mass to charge value, and ion intensity into a single point on this plot. This higher level grouping is useful to see if the charge-discharge cycles have an impact on the samples. But now we need to understand just what the chemical components are changing. In order to do that, we need to switch to a different statistical technique. This statistical technique is called orthogonal partial least squares discriminant analysis, or OPLSDA. Basically, it allows us to see which chemical components are causing the sample groups to plot the way that they do in the PCA. In other words, what is causing the group differences? Here, the markers at either extreme are different in the sample set. Therefore, these markers are worth further investigation in order to identify them. This view of the data illustrates a marker that starts to appear after many charge-discharge cycles. The marker in question has a mass to charge value of 117. Here's the MSMS -MS spectrum of the mass to charge value of 117. From this mass spectrum, we can see that the 117 ion is actually a fragment from a larger molecule that has a mass to charge value of 236. The question you may have is, what is the molecular structure of this ion? So what is the identity of 236? Shown here is the, act, the structural elucidation step where Unify provides candidate structures after a query to ChemSpider. To improve the accuracy of the hit, the database uses mass fragments and isotope ratios in order to increase match confidence. Based on our knowledge of the battery chemistry, the structure that is proposed by the elucidation tool looks reasonable. If this candidate is reasonable, then it is possible to explain the fragment ions that we observed in the MSMS -MS spectrum. Shown here are the corresponding chemical structures of each of those fragment ions. Here's another marker ion at mass to charge value 131 that appears to be causing samples to change after several charge and discharge cycles. For example, the marker we have identified is 2R5 oxotetrahydro 2 furan carboxylic acid is present in 180 and 200 charge discharge cycles, but not in the earlier cycles. Based on the additives and solvents that we know in the electrolyte solution, this structure also appears to be reasonable. I am not sure if there's a connection between fluoroethylene carbonate, or FEC, and the acid I mentioned on the previous slide. Industrially, the acid is made from the condensation of glutamic acid. So perhaps there is a solvent con condensation reaction between the acid and with the car carbonate solvents. Fluoroethylene carbonate is a typical lithium ion battery electrolyte solvent, so its presence is expected. However, what is not clear is whether there are, is a direct link between the decrease in FEC at the same time as the acid increases. Battery electrolyte mixtures are complex solutions, so perhaps there is a connection but further studies are required to determine a direct structural link. So this presentation covered a lot today. I started by providing you with a context on lithium ion batteries and why they're important for enabling a transition away from carbon-based energy sources. I then pivoted to the six main R&D challenges as outlined by the inventors of lithium ion battery technology in their Nobel Prize in Chemistry acceptance speeches. Next, I highlighted an analytical methodology that leverages both GC and LC, combined with high-resolution mass spectrometry to study the electrolyte in a lithium-ion battery. I did this by illustrating an application. The benefits of using GC and LC combined with a HRMS system means that we can see more. We can see both the volatile and non-volatile chemical components within a lithium-ion battery electrolyte solution. Since there are so many side reactions, it is important to be able to follow all of them in order to give us a better coverage. And finally, earlier in the presentation, I introduced you the four main parts of the lithium ion battery, namely the cathode, anode, separator, and electrolyte. This methodology that I showed you today was tailored towards the electrolyte, but it can be 
adapted and extended to provide insights into the other parts of the battery. So the technique that I outlined can also be added to other analytical techniques, such as NMR, TGA, and battery calorimetry to provide researchers a, with a comprehensive view of what's happening inside the battery pack as they work to develop even better batteries. I would like to thank several of my colleagues who helped with acquiring the data and assisted in putting this presentation together today. Lastly, I would like to thank you for attending this presentation. We will now transition into the Q&A portion of today's presentation. And thank you once again to Brian. So that uh, was the, the final part of the pre-recorded aspect, but we're now going in to the Q&A. So what I'll do is I will turn on Brian, Chris and Sarah's microphone. Sarah's already live. Hopefully we'll be able to hear them soon. And they have very kindly offered uh, not only to share their uh, email addresses, which hopefully you can see on screen now, but also they're going to switch their webcams on. So hopefully we'll see them shortly as well. So just give them a sec. It looks like Brian's coming through now. And uh, there we go, we've got everybody on screen now. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Brian, thank you for preparing the excellent presentation. I've got about 10 minutes to get through some of the audience questions as they've come in. So uh, one, uh, there's been a common sort of theme about different types of batteries and so on. So let's go with Jamil's question, which is, he was specifically asking about comparing lithium ion to aluminium graphite or lithium sulfur and so on, but would we use similar techniques if we wanted to understand the workings of other types of batteries, or is there something specific about lithium ion that we're doing here? Brian, you prepared the presentation, it feels only fair to let you have the first bite of this. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, the question, I mean, I know with lithium ion batteries, we tend to focus on this particular technique, and that's what we've done. I am not familiar with the other battery technologies as much that are out there for the aluminum graphite that's mentioned, um, but I think there are options as long as these techniques would work for systems that have electrolytes solutions in them, then they could be possibly applied. Um, that would probably be my takeaway from that question. I don't know if Chris or Sarah would have anything else to add, but um, I'll be happy to turn it over to one of them. I'd be happy to, to add. So. Um... There's a, there's a, so the lithium ion battery is really the dominant commercial version at the moment. You know, it's in cars and all that stuff. But the, the, there's alternatives because there's a lot of sustainability issues with extracting the lithium and the cobalt and everything. So they're looking at maybe things that are more ubiquitous, more common, um, you know, sodium ion cells and things like that. Um, also moving towards more carbon based uh, battery technologies. So they're looking for technologies that, um, you know, the, the, the more carbon-based technology that goes into a cathode, like an organometallic or whatever, uh, the methodologies that Brian described would be more applicable, uh, even more so than the, the, the current version that is available. Sarah, as a, an MS specialist, are you seeing MS applications in a variety of battery techniques or battery types? It hasn't come through so much for us in the Americas, but I know our colleagues over in Asia have seen a lot of inf a lot of research interest in battery formation and the electrolyte solutions. And, and, and to add to, uh, to to what Sarah said, um, particularly in in three Asian countries, so China, Japan, and Korea, uh, a lot of people are either doing you know like the research I, I mentioned with organometallic cathodes and anodes and things like that, and uh, and then looking at alternatives, uh, I know somebody mentioned the um, uh, polymeric um, replacement for the traditional electrolyte fluid and things like that. So people are looking at all these kind of things. But if you look at the patents and all that, it's intense uh, in Asia and it's it's less so in, in, in Europe and in the U.S. Well, let's, let's look at specifics in terms of techniques and so on. We've had a question from uh, Prajit who says, why is APGC preferable and what are the major advantages of HRMS? And Chris, I saw your expression there, so I feel like we should hand that one to you. Oh, I was thinking that was probably an ideal uh, question for Sarah. <laughs> oh, okay, Sarah, please do go ahead. Yeah. Uh, certainly. So that's actually two questions in there. I'll start with the first one about APGC versus EI. Um, the major advantage for the APGC source and its design 
is that we get more molecular ion information because it's a softer ionization technique. So if we're looking for unknowns, now we have that intact molecular ion that we can search against uh, for elemental composition and chemical libraries. Uh, HRMS, or high resolution mass spec, is kind of the second part of the question. As Brian kind of covered in his presentation, that helps give us accurate mass information. So if, again, we have unknown compounds or even if we have an idea what compounds we're looking for, we get more information with the high res mass spec than we would with a single quad or tandem quadrupole kind of unit resolution mass spec. So that helps us identify those unknowns and do a full chemical characterization of the sample. Yeah. Speaking of the software as well, uh, Siva Kumar asked what other sorts of research Unify would be useful for. I'm not sure who wants to take that one on. Yeah, um, sure, Ben, I can at least start. And uh, so Unify software is a compliant ready software that is based on an Oracle database, and it can be used in a number of areas, such as pharmaceutical industry, but we typically see this used a lot for accurate mass screening. So something like we just showed taste a little bit today, where you have uh, a sample that you want to know what's, what is in it, uh, what, how much is in it, and what else is in it, and you want to maybe compare different samples and do some statistics. So it's really well suited for that. Uh, you can also do metabolic pathway uh, types of analyses. So that means like understanding the fate of molecules. So for example, if some uh, when we digest our food, you know, we break it down into more smaller polar, you know, compounds or called metabolites. And so understanding the metabol, you know, the metabolism and understanding those pathways uh, can be used for something like this as well. And, uh, and some people also use this for quantitation, as I mentioned. So you can do similar uh, quantitative techniques such as um, top MRM, which is analogous to your MRM multi reaction monitoring, which is done, but it's the gold standard kind of typically done on a tandem or triple quad mass spectrometer. And so you can do that similar type of approach there. So I would say those are some of the areas that we could definitely look at you see in Unify, but you know, ENL uh, samples, so extractable leachables, um, toxicology testing, um, you know, there's a number that can go on. So um, I don't know if Sarah, if you wanted to mention anything else, uh, pesticides is uh, I think another area that's also, you, you, we see Unify being used quite a bit. Yeah, I think as Brian's already mentioned, Unify is really powerful for that accurate mass screening. So what high resolution mass spec gives you is that chemical information. And then we build it in with libraries to try and do that uh, characterization in one platform. Well, we've got about three minutes left. So let's see if we can squeeze in two questions really quickly. Sarah, sticking with you, um, do you have any tricks of the trade for developing custom libraries? It's something Brian mentioned earlier, but clearly it's the sort of thing that will help speed up our workflow. Yeah, so that's a good question for, you know, generating libraries. What do we need? Where does that information come from? And typically, to build a library in our Unify software, all you need is a chemical name and then a structure, because that structure will give you your elemental composition, um, can also do theoretical fragmentation based on the structure. Uh, but in terms of actually finding what those compounds are, that's going to involve a little bit of research. So um, I had lists from Sigma, uh, from other, you know, chemical additive manufacturers uh, that I could kind of build on, but also just knowing uh, the product you're looking for, so knowing what's in these electrolyte solutions and what we expect to see. Um, one final question. I think we'll throw this one to Chris. We've talked a lot about electrolytes today and the sorts of techniques we can use. Can we use uh, the similar techniques, HRMS, for example, on the anode and cathode as well, or is this exclusively an electrolyte thing? Yeah, so, you know, like I alluded to before, I mean, if you look at the, the battery, it's really the three primary uh, categories that it's made out of is inorganic, polymer, and organic. And uh, um, a wholly Inorganic, um, you know, anode or a cathode are it's going to be a little difficult to analyze, you know, with HRMS. However, when you have organic components in there or organometallic, then your, you know, you, your this technique will be adaptable to the anode cathode as well as expanding on the electrolyte. So, so it depends on where the technology goes. Really, that's that's the thing. 
to so watch this space, of course. Well, look, thank you ever so much, all three of you, in particular, Brian, for, for doing all of the legwork to prepare that presentation for us. We are pretty much out of time, but before we go, we'd like to know a tiny bit more about our audience. And uh, I will tell you some more info while we share this last poll. So what are the major challenges that you face in terms of uh, analytical characterization? Let's give you a few seconds to, uh, to tell us a little bit more about that. Meanwhile, I will let you know that uh, this is, uh, as I said, it's sort of coincides with the launch of the Chemistry World Sustainability Collection, which has got lots of fantastic content from Waters. Chemistryworld.com slash sustainability is where you will find uh, everything there, including all of those free resources and so on. And while you're there, if you haven't already registered for a free account with Chemistry World, it's a good opportunity. We will use that to tell you about other similar webinars and other events coming up that hopefully will be beneficial either to your general academic interest or your particular career. So uh, we'll just give you a few more seconds to vote there. Little reminder, those of you who attended live will get a certificate in your in inbox in a day or so's time. You'll also get a link to the recorded version of this webinar. And so if there's anything that you wanted to go back and look at again, then you'll be able to do that. So uh, I think that's enough time for enough of you to vote. I will have a look at that later. It will help us to form future webinars for you. There's the link on screen now. Go there now, download the Waters resources, grab everything else that you need, read those articles. There's a lot there. Uh, Chris Stumpf, in fact, is very heavily involved in a lot of that. So thank you also, Chris, for spending your time with us today, as well as helping us to write those articles, record the podcast and so on. I can highly recommend Chris's contributions to the podcast, where you also get to see even more of my face if you're not sick of me yet. So thank you to everybody for attending. Thank you to Chris, Sarah and Brian uh, for joining us today and Brian for preparing that uh, presentation. Huge thank you to Waters, one of our favorite partners, always helping us to find excellent people to produce excellent content. So that's it for this Chemistry World webinar. We will be back with more Chemistry World webinars very soon. Keep an eye out on chemistryworld.com slash webinars if these are the sorts of events you enjoy. And do drop us a line if there's anything you'd like to know more about or if you have any other questions about our webinars and about our partners. So thank you once again to all three of you, Chris, Sarah, Brian. And thank you to you, the audience. And we'll see you for the next Chemistry World webinar. Thanks very much. <laughs>